the sewing was curiously tranquil. Her skin, for this was her sixth month with child, had acquired a wonderful translucent quality. The mouth was soft, and the eyes, with their new placid look, seemed larger, darker than before. When the clock said ten minutes to five, she began to listen, and a few moments later, punctually as always, she heard the tyres on the gravel outside and the car door slamming. She laid aside her sewing, stood up, and went forward to kiss him as he came in. Hello, darling, she said. Hello, he answered. She took his coat and hung it in the closet. Then she walked over and made the drinks, a strongish one for him, a weak one for herself, and soon she was back again in her chair with her sewing, and he in the other opposite, holding the tall glass with both his hands, rocking it so the ice cubes tickled against the side. For her this was always a blissful time of day. She knew he didn't want to speak much until the first drink was finished, and she, on her side, was content to sit quietly, enjoying his company after the long hours alone in the house. She loved to luxuriate in the presence of this man, and to feel that warm male glow that came out of him to her when they were alone together. Tired, darling? Yes, he said, I'm tired. And as he spoke he did an unusual thing. He lifted his glass and drained it in one swallow, although there was still half of it, at least half of it left. He paused a moment, leaning forward in the chair, then he got up and went slowly over to fetch himself another. I'll get it, she cried, jumping up. Sit down, he said. When he came back she noticed that the new drink was dark amber with a quantity of whiskey in it. Darling, shall I get your slippers? No. She watched him as he began to sip the dark yellow drink and she could see little oily swirls in the liquid because it was so strong. I think it's a shame, she said, that when a policeman gets to be as senior as you, they keep him walking about on his feet all day long. He didn't answer. Would you like me to get you some cheese? I haven't made any supper because it's Thursday. No, he said. Well, if you're too tired to eat out, she went on, it's still not too late. There's plenty of meat and stuff in the freezer and, well, you can have it right here and not even move out of your chair. Forget it, he said. But darling, you must eat. I'll fix it anyway and you can have it here or not as you like. She stood up and placed her sewing on the table by the lamp. Sit down, he said. Just for a minute, sit down. It wasn't until then that she began to get frightened. Listen, he said, I've got something to tell you. This is going to be a bit of a shock to you, I'm afraid, but I've thought about it a good deal and I've decided that the only thing to do is to tell you right away. I hope you won't blame me too much. It didn't take long, and she sat very still through it all, watching him with a kind of dazed horror as he went further and further away from her with each word. So there it is, he added. And I know it's kind of a bad time to be telling you, but there simply wasn't any other way. Of course I'll give you money and I'll see that you're looked after. Her first instinct was not to believe any of it. To reject it all. I'll get the supper. She managed to whisper, and this time he didn't stop her. When she walked across the room, she couldn't feel her feet touching the floor. She couldn't feel anything at all, except a slight nausea and a desire to vomit. Everything was automatic now. Down the steps to the cellar, the light switch, the deep freeze, the hand inside the cabinet taking hold of the first object it met. She lifted it out and looked at it. It was wrapped in paper, so she took off the paper and looked at it again. A leg of lamb. All right, then, they would have lamb for supper. She carried it upstairs, holding the thin bone end of it with both her hands, and as she went through the living room, she saw him standing over by the window with his back to her, and she stopped. For God's sake, he said, hearing her but not turning around, don't make supper for me. I'm going out. At that point, 
Mary Maloney simply walked up behind him and without any pause she swung the big frozen leg of lamb high in the air and brought it down as hard as she could on the back of his head. She might just as well have hit him with a steel club. She stepped back a pace, waiting. Then he crashed to the carpet. The violence of the crash, the noise, the small table overturning, helped bring her out of the shock. She came out slowly, feeling cold and surprised, and she stood for a while blinking at the body, still holding the ridiculous piece of meat tight with both hands. All right, she told herself. So I've killed him. It was extraordinary now how clear her mind became all of a sudden. She began to think very fast. As the wife of a detective, she knew quite well what the penalty would be. She carried the meat into the kitchen, placed it in a pan, turned the oven on high and shoved it inside. Then she washed her hands and ran upstairs to the bedroom. She sat down before the mirror, tidied her face, touched up her lips. She tried to smile. It came out rather dull. She tried again. I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes, and I think a can of peas. That was better. Both the smile and the voice were coming out better now. She rehearsed it several times more. Then she ran downstairs, took a coat, went out the back door, down the garden and into the street. It wasn't six o'clock yet and the lights were still on in the grocer's shop. Why, good evening, Mrs Maloney. How are you? I want some potatoes, please, Sam. Yes, and I think a can of peas. The man turned and reached up behind him on the shelf for the peas. Patrick's decided he's tired and doesn't want to eat out tonight, she told him. We usually go out Thursdays, you know. Now he's caught me without any vegetables in the house. Then how about some meat, Mrs Maloney? No, I've got meat, thanks. I got a nice leg of lamb. From the freezer. Oh, anything else then? The grocer cocked his head on one side and looked at her pleasantly. What are you going to give him for afterwards? Well, what would you suggest, Sam? The man glanced around his shop. How about a nice big slice of cheesecake? Perfect, she said. And when it was all wrapped and she had paid, she put on her brightest smile and said, Thank you, Sam. Good night. That's the way, she told herself. Keep everything absolutely natural and there'll be no need for any acting at all. Therefore, when she entered the kitchen by the back door, she was humming a little tune to herself and smiling. Patrick, she called. How are you, darling? She put the parcel down on the table and went through into the living room. And when she saw him lying there on the floor, with his legs doubled up and one arm twisted back underneath his body, it really was rather a shock. All the old love and longing for him welled up inside her and she ran over to him, knelt down beside him and began to cry her heart out. A few minutes later, she got up and went to the phone. She knew the number of the police station and when the man on the other end answered, she cried to him, Quick! Come quick! Patrick's dead! Who's speaking? Mrs Maloney! Mrs Patrick Maloney! You mean Patrick Maloney's dead? I think so, she sobbed. He's lying on the floor and I think he's dead. Be right over, the man said. The car came very quickly and when she opened the front door, two policemen walked in. She knew them both and she fell right into Jack Noonan's arms, weeping hysterically. He put her gently into a chair. What happened? Briefly, she told her story about going out to the grocer and coming back to find him on the floor. While she was talking, crying and talking, Noonan discovered a small patch of congealed blood on the dead man's head. He showed it to O'Malley, who got up at once and hurried to the phone. Which grocer? one of the detectives asked. She told him, and he turned and whispered something to the other detective, who immediately went outside into the street. In fifteen minutes he was back with a page of notes, and there was more whispering, and through her sobbing she heard a few of the whispered phrases acted quite normal, very cheerful, wanted to give him a good supper. After a while, the photographer and the doctor departed and the two other men came in and took the corpse away on a stretcher. The two detectives remained and so did the two policemen. 
They were exceptionally nice to her, and Jack Noonan asked if she wouldn't rather go somewhere else. To her sister's house, perhaps. No, she said. She didn't feel she could move even a yard at the moment. Would they mind awfully if she stayed just where she was until she felt better? So they left her there while they went about their business searching the house. Sometimes Jack Noonan spoke to her gently as he passed by. Her husband, he told her, had been killed by a blow on the back of the head administered with a heavy blunt instrument. They were looking for the weapon. It's the old story, he said. Get the weapon and you've got the man. The search went on. It began to get very late. Nearly nine, she noticed by the clock on the mantel. The four men searching the room seemed to be growing weary, a trifle exasperated. Jack, she said the next time Sergeant Noonan went by, would you mind giving me a drink? Sure, I'll give you a drink. You mean this whisky? Yes, please. But just a small one. It might make me feel better. He handed her the glass. Why don't you have one yourself? She said. You must be awfully tired. Oh, please do. You've been very good to me. Well, he answered. It's not strictly allowed, but I might take just a drop to keep me going. One by one, the others came in and were persuaded to take a little nip of whisky. They stood round rather awkwardly with the drinks in their hands, uncomfortable in her presence, trying to say consoling things to her. Sergeant Noonan wandered into the kitchen, came out quickly and said, Look, Mrs Maloney, you know that oven of yours is still on and the meat's still inside. Oh, dear me, she cried. So it is. I'd better turn it off for you, hadn't I? Oh, will you do that, Jack? Thank you so much. When the sergeant returned, she looked at him with her large, dark, tearful eyes. Jack, she said. Yes? Would you do me a small favour? You and the others. We can try, Mrs Maloney. Well, she said, here you all are, and good friends of dear Patrick's too, and helping to catch the man who killed him. You must be terrible hungry by now because it's long past your supper time. Why don't you eat up that lamb that's in the oven? It'll be cooked just right by now. Wouldn't dream of it, Sergeant Noonan said. Please, she begged. Personally, I couldn't touch a thing. It'd be a favour to me if you'd eat it up. There was a good deal of hesitating among the four policemen, but they were clearly hungry, and in the end they were persuaded to go into the kitchen and help themselves. The woman stayed where she was, listening to them through the open door. Have some more, Charlie. No, 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 better not finish it. She wants us to finish it. She said so. Be doing her a favour. Oh, OK, then. That's the hell of a big club that guy must have used to hit poor Patrick, one of them was saying. The doc says his skull was smashed all to pieces, just like from a sledgehammer. Well, that's why it ought to be easy to find. Exactly what I say. However done it, they're not going to be carrying a thing like that around with them longer than they need. One of them belched. Personally, I think it's right here in the premises. It's probably right under our very noses. What do you think, Jack? And in the other room, Mary Maloney began to giggle.